Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Richard Fleming, and today is Saturday, December 19, 2020. I'm going to begin this video broadcast by doing something I rarely do, taking a personal example out of my life to begin the point of discussion. When I was an internal medicine resident, my wife and I were expecting our first baby. A girl. There was bleeding almost every night, with the exception of one night. And there was a great concern about whether we would lose her. One of the abnormal blood tests that came back was an alpha fetal protein level. Now, as an internal medicine resident, to me that meant liver cancer, but it's also associated with spina bifida and other potential birth defects. The blood test was done twice and it came back elevated both times. In preparation to meet with the OB-GYN who was supposedly one of the best OB-GYNs in the city, I read up on alpha fetoprotein. <clears throat> the physician wanted to do an amniocentesis. He thought this would find the correct alpha fetoprotein level but what I read showed that alpha fetoprotein levels come back higher in amniotic fluid. So when we were in visiting with the ob I mentioned to him that I had read material that showed that alpha fetoprotein levels are higher in amniotic fluid than they are in the blood. And he was surprised. I was stunned. My impression was that somebody who had been practicing ob for decades should know more than an internal medicine resident and certainly should know that the alpha feta protein levels would be higher in amniotic fluid and not be surprised by published research showing that. <clears throat> I'm a cardiologist, originally a physicist, but now a nuclear cardiologist as well with training. Yes, I developed the inflammation and cardiovascular disease theory that explains why people with SARS-CoV-2 are dying from inflammation and blood clotting. But it has never been my expectation that I should need to become a virologist or immunologist. <clears throat> and yet, with each passing day, the questions that I have and the papers that I read, I wonder why the experts in the field are unfamiliar with these studies. <clears throat> During the last two weeks, both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were approved by the FDA. And along with those EUA, emergency use authorizations, came commentary by me wondering where the antibody levels were for <clears throat> the patients in these studies. Antibodies, as you may know, are the way in which our immune system reacts to something coming into the body that shouldn't be there. It's one of only a couple of approaches, <clears throat> but it's particularly germane to the discussion today. This morning, I read a paper out of Osaka, Japan. The title of this paper, although it's a preprint, is an infectivity enhanced site on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is targeted by COVID-19 patient antibodies. What that means is that they have found antibodies that attack SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And because they do so, it increases the ability of the virus to infect and kill people. Now, you should know that a lot of people come down with strep throat every year and require antibiotic treatment. Most people believe the antibiotics are to kill the bacteria. They are. But the major benefit of the antibiotic is to prevent you from developing antibodies to the bacteria. And the reason why that's important is because once the body makes the antibodies to the bacteria, 
those antibodies will attack anything that looks like the bacteria. And two of the valves, particularly the mitral valve and aortic valve of the heart, have similarities. And as a result, patients who get bacterial streptococcus pneumoniae, strep throat, who are not treated with antibiotics, run the risk of developing antibodies, which will later attack their own heart. And as a result, they will develop something called rheumatic heart disease and quite frequently require valve replacement later in life to keep them from dying. <clears throat> the researchers in Osaka released information that shows that particularly when they looked at individuals who were hospitalized with severe COVID-19 symptoms, that these individuals tended to develop antibodies not only to the notorious spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, but to another part of the spike protein called the N-terminal domain. Now, I know the terms get to be overwhelming, particularly if you've had no background training in the field. But the spike protein actually has two parts, the S1 and the S2. The S1 not only has that part called the regional binding domain, abbreviated RBD, which attaches to the ACE2 receptor, but it also has the N terminal domain. It is the development of antibodies to the N terminal domain that is the problem. <clears throat> the vaccines are giving people the entire genetic code to make the entire spike protein. So these vaccines, both of them, not only contain the regional binding domain that you want to knock out so that the virus can't infect cells with the ACE2 receptor, but they also contain the N terminal domain. <clears throat> When the antibodies that people make to the N-terminal domain are made and attack the N-terminal domain, it changes the shape of the N-terminal domain, the NTD. And with the change in that shape, there is a change in the regional binding domain that attaches to the ACE2 receptor. What is the change? It opens up the regional binding domain. And by opening it up, it has a greater ability to attach to the ACE2 receptor and infect cells. <clears throat> Bottom line, the vaccines contain the N-terminal domain and people will make antibodies to the N-terminal domain that will then increase the ability of the virus to infect the people. In the same way that the antibodies to the strep in your throat can cause valve damage to the heart, <clears throat> these antibodies can increase the ability of the virus to infect you. Now, if this were the first time <clears throat> that humanity knew about this, we might say, wow, we just didn't know. But this is SARS-CoV-2. Two prior SARS viruses, <clears throat> severe acute respiratory syndrome viruses that kill people by producing inflammation and blood clots. Two prior SARS viruses are well known. SARS-CoV-1 from 2002 and the Mediterranean version called MERS from the 2007 era. <clears throat> In both instances, researchers showed that antibodies made to those viruses 
would change what's called the FC component of the antibodies. A different area of the antibody that increased the infectivity to SARS-CoV-1 and to MERS by giving vaccines that produced antibodies. The FC is the area where the complement cascade or the blood clotting part attaches to the antibody. But this specific new change is not just to the FC component, it's to the S protein itself on the N terminal domain. Bottom line, the research has shown that vaccinating individuals for SARS-CoV-1 or MERS increased the development of antibodies that made the viruses even more infective. The research now shows that vaccinating people with this S protein <clears throat> increases the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2 and accounts for the major difference between people who end up in the hospital and those who do not. It is related to the immune response that we've been talking about with all the people with the comorbidities or a naive immune system. This information should have been discussed by the FDA committees that approved emergency use authorization. This information should have been discussed by the FDA, Health and Human Services, CDC, NIAID with Dr. Fauci, Dr. Redfield, Dr. Hahn, Dr. Burks, the World Health Organization. If a physicist nuclear cardiologist can find the information being done by experts in the field, in immunology and virology. Research that shows a major concern with these vaccines. The question is, why didn't the FDA and other agencies do their job? This is time not to celebrate these vaccines, but to raise serious questions about why they were approved and the potential consequences for harm and death among people that are taking the vaccines. <clears throat> Not only do I believe a moratorium should be called on these vaccines at this point in time, but those individuals that were responsible that have knowledge of this and yet promoted these vaccines should be held criminally accountable in international court for crimes against humanity.